I'm Megan Richardson. Um, I have uh, been in this UT system for about almost 20 years. Um, I have about 16 years of child abuse, and that's my specialty right now. I actually work at the uh, UT North uh, campus uh, on a uh, trauma and abuse services for kids program. <clears throat> and we specialize in, uh, we, what we do is we help the local surrounding uh, children's advocacy centers. And right now I believe we have 13 that we support. And my role is supporting their medical programs. Um, and like Dr. Desai said, I'm almost also a, a nurse practitioner and I work in the uh, ER. Uh, I've worked as a paramedic, I've been a flight nurse, I've been a first responder, so I, I kind of know where you guys are coming from. And so I just want to give you a little bit of information that I think would have helped me. Um, I'm going to try to not make this boring, but it's basic recognizing and reporting. Um, and like I said, some of it's stuff you may not have thought of previously. Um, so I, I also work, I work a lot with the Children's Advocacy Center in Smith County. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about advocacy centers here in just a few minutes. So. Uh, so what is child abuse? So there's two primary components of child abuse, and a child and an act. And the Child Protective Services Law uh, defines child as an individual under 18 years of age, and the law considers both an act of harm to a child and the failure to act to prevent harm to a child when defining an act of child abuse. Um, so an act is something that is done to harm or cause potential harm to a child. Um, and a failure to act is something that is not done to um, prevent harm or potential harm to a child. Child sexual abuse is any sexual act between an adult and a minor, or it can be between two minors um, when one exerts power over the other one. And so forcing, coercion, persuading a child to engage in any type of sexual act, non-contact such as, you know, exposing themselves, uh, exposure to pornography, uh, voyeurism, communicating in a sexual manner. Um, so I know it's boring, but it's, that's the definition for you. So statistics, uh, today, by the time um, we're done with this, 175 children will have been sexually abused. Um, about one in 10 children will have been a victim of sexual abuse by their 18th birthday. And one in four, depending on the statistics you look at, but typically one in four girls um, and one in six boys will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. Um, 90% of children know their perpetrator. It's not the stranger you know. It's the one, it's the monster that you do know. That's the one that's actually um, in their home or well known to them. Um, only about 38% of child victims disclose the fact that they've been sexually abused. Some never disclose. And only actually less than 1% of perpetrators ever spend a day in jail. Um, the younger the victim, the more likely the perpetrator is a juvenile. Uh, there are offenders in about 43% of assaults on kids under the age of six. So as many as 400,000 babies born will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday, unless we try to do something about it. And I see a lot of stuff that talks about uh, preventing child abuse, that you know we're gonna be able to prevent it. We can to a degree, but a lot of it is about um, giving children knowledge to protect themselves. So I just want to show you, this is a, a drawing that a child did at one of our advocacy centers. And it looks really nice. And you've got, you know, home sweet home. And there's a question mark, if you see that. Um, it looks like a nice house. And you've got a, a nice purple flower here and a sad little girl over here. But if you look at the house too, you look at the different colors of the, um, the windows and the door. And this little girl's abuse, I believe she was six, um, her, she was being sexually abused in the back of the house. And so this wasn't a safe place for her. The front of the house was, but the back of the house was not a safe place. So um, I'm going to play a little video for you guys about advocacy centers just so you'll kind of know what they are. I'm a survivor of abuse. Growing up, I was in a family that um, unfortunately was just filled with a lot of turmoil. My mom and dad were only 16 when I was born. Um, my father immediately said I was not his child and left. 
and my mother immediately moved on to another man. There are six of us. There's five brothers and sisters, and almost every one of us have a different father. And the environment was just filled with drugs and alcohol and abuse, and, and really it was just a, a really chaotic and dysfunctional family environment. Well, everyone knows probably what we do, but I would describe it as a place where children are truly cared for. The best part of it is that we take them at their hurting point and we start to help them heal. And so it's just a place of healing and love and people who are really good at what they do. So historically, children had to go from um, agency to agency, CPS, um, law enforcement agencies, district attorney's offices, hospitals. And so we like to have all of the agencies here in one location while the child is interviewed by one person. And then that interview is shared with our all of our partner agencies um, in, in efforts to minimize trauma. I was four when she married um, one of my stepdads and we moved, we moved there to his home and right next door was his father and his mother and his grandfather was um, the first person that I can recall um, it was very abusive. He was very controlling and the things that he said, um, he would, he would, you know, come into my home when I was sleeping at night and do things. He would um, bring me into his home and there was a, a little sunroom garden area that he would take me and my siblings into as well to do things. He would just threaten, which is a very normal thing is he would threaten that if I ever said anything that he would hurt my mom or hurt my siblings. And being the oldest kid, I had that natural responsibility thing that I wanted to protect my brothers and my sisters. The first time um, that someone noticed was I was in kindergarten and the kindergarten teacher recognized and she turned, um, she recognized some of the signs and you know that are a lot of time there are signs, we just don't necessarily want to see them. But she saw these signs and she uh, called Child Protective Services. As a family advocate, we meet with the families when they first come to our center. We are able to have the children play out in the lobby while we visit with the protective caregiver. Um, during that time, we're able to explain to them exactly what their day is going to look like while they're at our center. The world's been turned upside down, so there might be several resources that they might need, um, from transportation to housing to food to medical needs. If there is a medical forensic health exam that has to be done, we work closely with our nurse practitioner and our nurses that are on staff that are able to perform those exams for them. My room here is decorated as superheroes. I think that every child I see is a superhero, and I tell them. I tell them how amazing they are and how proud of them I am, and it takes a superhero to go through what they've gone through. If the case becomes criminal, then we also walk that walk with that family as well. As it becomes closer to time for that child to appear in court and to face their perpetrator, we have a kids in court program that helps educate that child, and so they're very prepared when they go into the courtroom to know where the judge is gonna be, what the jury's about, um, where their perpetrator is going to be and what the rules are at the courtroom. And so that really does help. They brought me in to this, it's a building very similar to y'all's because I had walked into y'all's and I was like, oh wow, even as a six year old, I could remember what that was like walking through those halls and then the little, the kid, the smaller kid room that had like the dolls and the, the teddy bears. And I remember them taking me into that room and handing me this doll and they were able to calm me down and um, make me feel comfortable and make me feel safe. And they um, showed me some things on the doll and they asked me on the doll, they said, could you please show us some of the, the ways that your grandfather where he's touched you or what are some of the things that he's done to you. And that was a real, I don't know, I felt safe doing that on the doll. It wasn't me saying, this is what he did, you know, to me. And so I was able to share that. Um, and it turns out he had been doing this to over 20 kids in our immediate neighborhood. As a society, we do a great job in teaching our children, stranger danger, do not go with strangers, do not talk to strangers, do not take candy from strangers. However, national statistics show us that 
children who are abused, 90% um, of them know who their perpetrator is. 60% um, are going to be friends of the family. 30% are going to be family members with only 10% being strangers. Justice and protection are a very important part of the healing process, obviously. Feeling safe and secure is a big deal. But therapy, when a child, first off, when they recognize that what was going on with them and what was happening to them was not okay and it was not all right, and no matter what they were told, they didn't deserve it, and it wasn't their fault, um, therapy helps them begin to, to realize that and to process that not only was it not okay and was it not right, but that, they're, that they can be whole from that still, that they can, they can heal from that, that that doesn't have to shape their future. I really love that the Children's Advocacy Center of Smith County makes therapy available immediately following <coughs> situations. I didn't begin um, counseling and therapy until I was 18 or 19, and the first case of abuse was when I was five, confessed when I was six about everything going on. I feel like some of the things that I endured and that I went through and that I believed about myself, those things could have been addressed much earlier and I could have begin that, begun that healing process much earlier. So I love that they make that available. These children deserve a safe place to come and to tell their story and they deserve a place where they can be healed, where they can be helped, where they can find safety and justice. We are grateful to you for helping our children, those who are the most vulnerable in our community and who have no voice without the work we do. So that's a little bit <clears throat> about what advocacy centers do. Um, and so what happens is when you make a report of, um, of abuse, and I'll talk a little bit more about reporting in a few minutes, but what happens is when you call CPS, um, it goes to a statewide intake. In whatever county that that abuse is reported in, it goes to an advocacy center um, who is over that jurisdiction. And there's someone in that center who's reading those intake reports, who's able to see if this child needs to be seen now, uh, if they need to close it out, if they need to co um, collaborate with law enforcement. And so... And like I said, I'll, I'll go over that a few, in a few more minutes. So types of abuse, there's emotional um, neglect, physical, and sexual abuse. And so emotional abuse, this is really hard to prove for um, law enforcement. It's inflicting mental or emotional injury to a child. Um, it, it's just, it's one of the harder abuses to approve on children. It's, it's one to me that is sometimes longer lasting than the physical abuse, um, but it's just one of the harder ones for them to approve. Um, you know, self-harm, suicide attempts, feeling abandoned, uh, drugs, addiction, uh, you know, these are, of course, it doesn't mean that the, someone's been abused, but sometimes these are things that we're looking at. Uh, behavioral, they're overly compliant, they're, they, they're having fights with their friends. Um, Neglect, this is leaving a child in a situation where they could potentially be exposed to risk, to physical or mental harm. Um, maybe not arranging necessary care for the child. There is no specific age in Texas that says that you can't leave a child alone. There's not like 10 years old, five years old, but the child has to be able to care for themselves. So obviously if you're leaving a three-year-old home alone, they, they, can't, they can't get their own food. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, neglect, this is, you're going to see a lot of this probably as you're going into these homes, you, you know, dirty houses, the kids have poor living conditions, uh, lack of cleanliness, torn or dirty clothing, uh, domestic violence, they don't have a shelter, maybe they're living on the street, you know, not having a house is an abuse or neglect, but, you know, as long as a child's being cared for. Um, health risks, infestations, we, you know, if the child is infested with lice, does that mean it's abuse? It doesn't, but when it's over and over and over, the child's been treated for that, or if they have obvious open sores on their head, which I've seen that in children before, um, then that's when you're getting into the neglect. Uh, you know, they're not registered in school, they're, they're not intended for long periods of time, um, and so, 
you know, th also this is that when you're going to these houses and you, maybe you have a parent who's passed out in the floor because they're intoxicated and that child is left home alone, you know, that's neglect. That's something that's going to need to be reported. And again, we'll talk about the reporting in a few minutes. Uh, physical abuse, this is really going to be more what you're going to be visualizing. A physical injury that results in substantial harm to the child, um, an injury that's a var in variance with the history or explanation given. You know, your story doesn't line up with what happened. Um, you know, it's, it, it basically results in any substantial harm. You know, is spanking your child physical abuse? No. If they're spanking their child to the point causing injury, yes. Um, you know, we're at the advocacy center. They're a no harm, meaning they don't believe in, in uh, spanking. Um, but so examples, hitting, strangulation, or sometimes you'll hear choking, uh, shaking. Uh, it used to be shaken baby syndrome. It's abusive head trauma. And now, you know, kicking, biting, burning, slapping, punching, inflicting uh, injuries with objects. Thing to remember is called the 10-4 rule. And basically, it's Trunk, eyes, neck, four years or younger. These are, when you see injuries on these areas um, on a child four years or younger, um, it's gonna put your feelers up. And any bruising on a child four months or younger, it, they have to be investigated. Now, does that mean a child who is four months old can't have accidentally been, you know, received a bruise? No. but it warrants investigation. If they are, I'm going to repeat it again, if they are four months or younger, if, or if they are not mobile, meaning they are not rolling, they are not able to turn over, they, if you see a bruise on that child, it has to be investigated. I don't care where it is on their body. Um, the and then it's called 10-4 faces and then the P. So frenulum, the auricular area, and also the angle of the jaw uh, cheek, eyes, sclera, or any kind of pattern bruises. And I say that, so torso, again, it, this is a um, child that's not mobile. Kids protect their, be I mean, their bellies. If there's a bruise on a belly, it was a significant injury to cause a bruise on a belly, and it needs to be investigated, especially an infant or even a toddler that gets a bruise on their belly. It's concerning. Um, ears, especially, you know, behind the ears, um, that's pinching, that's boxing upside the head. Um, they may have been punched upside the face. Uh, if, if you got a pattern where you have a bruise on the front and the back, you know, that's pinching because, you know, or, or it can be a sign of pinching. Um, neck, worried about strangulation. Uh, sometimes these children, they don't even realize, you know, they don't say that they've been strangled. They may not even say they've been choked. They may not even realize really what happened. Um, and then this is a four month old or le four months or less. Just again, any bruising on those kids, it has to be looked at. Um, here are some pattern marks. So over here is an extension cord. Um, again, this is where when you're on scene, if you look around, you may not see it. But you know, if if you if you get called to a residence for an injury, you know, just at least note what's around you. Um, you can see the slap pattern on this kid um, where the handprints were. Um, these are fingers. They're probably kind of hard to see for you guys. There's fingerprints um, from a grab where the fingers left the impressions. Um, this, it's hard to see again. There's a shoe mark on this kid where they took his foot and stomped him, and he's got the impression of the uh, shoe mark on his belly. Um, this is from caning of some... Um, cultures, that's some of the discipline that they do, and this child was uh, hit with a uh, cane. And you can see that this is not okay, having this kind of bruising. And then, a, of course, they a belt, and you can see the pattern mark on the, um, on the, uh, the skin right here from the belt buckle. Um, these are some mouth injuries you might see is a frenulum tear. And that can be hiding some big head trauma on these children. Um, torn frenulum, that can be from forced feeding with a bottle. Uh, that can be from, you know, popping them in the mouth. And, um, and now, of course, again, if they're moving, could they have fallen and caused a tear? Absolutely. But 
the big thing I want you to realize is you are not here to investigate. We, you know, we're here to take care of the child and report and let other people investigate. I don't investigate. My job is to care for the child, report, and make sure the proper people who do investigate are able to. Um, soft palate bruising, that's very concerning, especially on a child. Um, that's from forced oral sex. That can be from objects forced into their mouth. I've seen this on kids. Um, you know, here we have a kiddo that, and also, I don't know, where's that picture? Um, I have a kid who, it may be on the other one. Um, okay, no, it's this one, sorry. The tongue laceration, the kid doesn't have any teeth. He couldn't have bit, obviously, his own tongue. Um, so, again, these are, these are things that are going to need to be investigated. Uh, now, fra you know, fractured teeth, could the kid have fallen? Yes. You know, could he have been hit in the mouth by a backhand? Yes. Um, and then, you know, bruising in the back of the throat. Again, here's some more uh, soft palate injuries. So, um, this is a subconjunctival hemorrhage. This was from a three-month-old um, who had been strangled. Uh, so anytime you see a subconjunctival hemorrhage in a infant, it is concerning because that child uh, probably didn't get it any other way. Uh, these are petechiae from strangulation, and you can even see they're on the inside of that uh, ear. And these are kind of light, again, on here, but there's little petechiae. They're just little tiny blood uh, vessels that have been ruptured. And um, it may be present on the neck, face, eyes, you know, inside the ears and the mouth. So this is, you, you have to look at these kids. And um, just signs, unexplained bruises, lacerations, broken bones, uh, you know, burns. If a kid has a burn or there's a pattern, you know, you want to document or you want to make note of, you know, what was said to you, why it happened. Um, some, again, it's unusual for the child's age. If they're not moving, if they're not walking, if they're not cru cruising, they're not bruising. That's my biggest thing. Don't cruise. You shouldn't bruise. Uh, parents tell you, well, I hit them with a belt, you know, and, you know, sometimes they get, I've had kids who got hit in the mouth from the belt buckle as the parents were hitting them. Uh, clothes hangers, floss waters. Uh, you know, I've had kids tell me they're scared to go home, and so a lot of time, and a lot of times they're they're not hitting these kids where we can see them. They have to be undressed to see what the injuries are. Um, behavioral, they're frightened to go home. They're they're scared of their parents, and, so, and and sometimes they're not. You have to remember these kids love their parents. They're a lot of times going to protect them. Some of these children have already been in the system and the known is better than the unknown. So they're not just going to come out and tell you, yeah, um, you know, mom just beat the crap out of me. So, um, you know, or if you go to touch them, they flinch and move away from you. Again, I just, my takeaway is all these are not means something's happening, but it means it needs to be investigated, you know, further. And again, with the big picture of everything that you're seeing. So, Accidental versus potentially suspicious. Um, so these would be kind of more of your, where accidental injuries would occur. So injuries tend to involve the parietal bone, occipital, or forehead. And that's just because those are kind of where the bo bony prominences are in the forehead. The nose, because if a kid falls, the first thing that, that's the first thing that's going to hit is their nose and their chin. You know, palms of your hand, you're going to put your hands down to catch yourself. Same with the elbows. Um, knees and shins. These are everything that, you know, they're, they're bony. They're going to hit that first. Um, and it's going to match the history. Now, could obviously an inflicted injury happen there? Sure. So here's your more likely non-accidental. Again, doesn't mean it isn't. So ears, you know, pinching the ears, black eyes, soft tissues of the cheeks, because, you know, you know kids can fall on their cheeks, but again, typically they're going to hit that forehead uh, first. Intraoral injuries, um, if they have, um, uh, like, where they're protecting themselves, I've seen kids where they've had bruises and marks on their forearms from trying to protect their faces. A uh, chest, abdomen, again, seeing an injury on an abdomen, you know, that's outside of like a car accident or a, a pretty significant fall is going to be a little unusual. Groin or genital injuries, I've seen bite marks, um, you know, bruises from being kicked from sexual abuse, um, tears. 
And then again, the inner aspects of the thigh, uh, because that's not something that they're just going to fall on. Um, we call this the triangle of safety between the ear and the shoulder and the neck because that's not something that's typically um, hit. So if you see an injury in that area, that's going to be concerning. Uh, again, the inner aspects of the arm because that's not something that's just, when again, when they fall or if they get hit, um, they're not going to get hit under that part of their arm. And then again, on the back and trunk and on the back of the legs because again, that's not typically something that they're just going to uh, fall on and get hurt. So sexual abuse, uh, sexual conduct is harmful to a child's mental, emotional, or physical welfare. Um, and this can also be taking photographs of the child, exposing the child, um, and just, they will prosecute in Texas um, age 10. So if a child is 10 or over, they can be prosecuted um, for a crime. And so, on, on the, so I've seen this difficulty walking or sitting. I have been doing this a long time. I've not had a child. I've had, okay, I've had one. I've had one kid who was having trouble sitting, but she had pretty significant tearing from um, her abuse. Her, her, it was an assault that had just occurred. Um, you know, difficulty urinating or complaints of burning, uh, that can be if the assault just occurred and they have some tears that, that are, uh, hurts when they pee or they may have a STD, or they could have a urine infection from um, penetration. Um, they also, a lot of times these kids will get constipation, especially if they're being anally assaulted, or they, or they can go opposite um, and they can have leakage of bowel. I've, I've had children too who just poop on themselves because they have no anal tone. And so that's pretty concerning. And if you have a child who a parent tells you, oh my gosh, they just started wetting the bed and they've been potty trained for the last four years, there's probably something going on. Now, could it be a medical condition? It could. But again, we're not investigating. We're just here to say, okay, we have a concern and we need to, we need to report that to someone. Behavioral indicators. So a child who is acting inappropriate for their age. You know, a four-year-old going to another four-year-old and going, hey, I'm going to show you yours. You know, I'm going to show you mine. Let me see yours. That's cool. We have something different or we have the same thing. That's not abnormal. If you have a nine-year-old who's, you know, masturbating in school, it, you know, that's concerning. And, um, you know, if children who have just mood changes, again, sometimes I have teenagers, they're moody, but if you have a kid who's been acting normal, then all of a sudden they go and their behavior totally changes. It's concerning. And I, I, these are, I've seen these kids. I've seen, I've had patients who've gone from straight A students who, to failing and, and dropping out of school. And uh, it's, it's pretty devastating. Um, grooming is huge in child sexual abuse and because they want these kids to let them do what they want to do to them. And there's, they target their victim, and they are really good at doing this. They are good at picking out their victims. They gain their trust. You know, they feel a need for that child. They may, this child may feel like they're not being loved at home. They may feel like, uh, you know, they don't have anybody to talk to. And this person comes in and takes that, fills that spot for them that they're not feeling. Um, you know, they isolate the child, um, sexualize the relationship, and then they main, can maintain control. These kids get scared. Either, you know, they go to, they get scared. They're, um, you know, if you tell somebody, you're, they're going to take you away from your mommy and daddy. If, uh, you know, I'll hurt your mom and dad if you tell somebody, nobody's going to believe you. Again, I, I've seen over 2,000 kids um, with sex, who've been sexually abused or have an outcry or concern. And I'm telling you, these are all things I have personally seen and taken care of. Um, so, we're talking about the child-to-child -child abuse versus normal sexual behaviors. Um, remember, not all child sexual abuse is between an adult and a child. If you have a 10-year-old and a, you know, 12-year-old, but the 10-year-old forced themselves on the 12-year-old, then that's still abuse. Uh, now, there's typically a, um, a three-year rule. So if you have two 12-year-olds having sex, they're not going to prosecute if it was consensual. But if you have a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old, they're going to prosecute that 16-year-old. And um, so just because they're two children uh, doesn't mean that they're not going to prosecute one because they can still coerce the other one to do, to do things. 
and this is also where, you know, it, I've had the kids who've um, videotaped, uh, you know, something happening. And then, you know, if you, do, if you tell anybody, I'm going to, you know, send this out. That's why I always tell kids, don't videotape yourself. Don't send pictures to people. Um, so the sexual play between children of similar size and age, that's totally normal. Um, you know, lighthearted, spontaneous. There may be giggling and laughing because, you know, it's funny. And, um, you know, it feels good. So kids are going to be, you know, they're going to do it. Uh, showing and looking at private parts, you know, concerns, they're preoccupied with sexual acts. Uh, they're acting out on um, their stuffed animals. And, um, you know, they're masturbating with objects. They engage in adult-type sexual acts. And, um, I mean, I've, I've had them uh, show me, and you know, because part of their exam with me is they tell me the history of what happened. And I've had children who are just pretty flippant about it and will just start acting out in front of me. And I'm like, oh, don't do that. Miss Megan doesn't need to see that. Um, so that's, they're just, they're kind of just like it's not a big deal to them. Uh, human trafficking, this is probably, I think everybody's kind of, or I've seen all the, the stuff on social media and the news now about trafficking and, you know, it's all of a sudden, a, you know, big, big to do, um, it, but it is, and it, and it has happened here, and I have taken care of patients who've been trafficked here in, uh, in East Texas, and I think that we don't really look for it, and they're pretty good at hiding it, and um, so trafficking is adult sex trafficking, adult labor trafficking, uh, child sex trafficking, and child labor trafficking, and um, so the trafficking of adults for sex by force, that's your adult sex trafficking, the labor trafficking is making them do late work um, by force. Uh, the ch the tr this child sex trafficking is any child under the age of 18 who's being forced into the uh, sexual act or the sexual um, industry. They are not prostitutes at 16 years old. They cannot uh, say, yes, I want to go out and be paid to have sex. They, they are, this is probably one of my pet peeves when I have... Uh, you know, calling a, a 15 or 16 year old a prostitute because that's, they didn't get into that by themselves. And then of course, child labor trafficking, that's where children are forced to do um, work for money or for um, uh, agriculture services. If they're under 18, they've been coerced into doing it. And sometimes that's, they're doing that because of their family. You know, we, we need, you have to do this to help protect your family. And I've had kids who've um, been told that they had to do this because they knew where their families were. And that they would, and that you know, and they're they're scared. Um, so signs, especially when you you know, these are going to be things when you're coming up and running on these calls. You know, if they're disoriented, if they're malnourished. They the person doesn't even know their name, or they may not know the person's with them. You know, you'll ask them what their name, and they'll give you just their first name or, or some uh, nickname that they call them, but they don't know what their their last name is. Uh, tattoos are really big. Their pimps like to brand uh, their girls. And this is very dangerous because you have to remember this is big money for them. They can sell drugs and it's a one hit and that money is gone. You know, but when you have a child that you can prostitute out and they can make, you know, they can turn a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a night. And if they lose their uh, money, you know, it, it's dangerous for these kids to get out of. Uh, they know where their families live. That's a lot of times how they they get them. I've one. I had a kid who, you know, he picked her up from her house, and she knew. You know, they told her that she knew. They knew where she lived now, and she was going to do what they said, or, you know, that they were going to kill her family. So, what are you going to do as a, a kiddo? You're going to do what they tell you to do. And remember, trafficking doesn't have to be someone you don't know. Um, We've had family members who've trafficked their kids. And so it, it, it's not always the, uh, the scary you know, guy in the, the corner. Um, a lot of times, too, there's women that they, uh, who've been in their, um, uh, I can't remember what the name of it is, but they, they've basically been uh, in their group since they started, and then they use them to recruit these girls in because they... Uh, you know, promise them this stuff. They see that they are, have a great life, which they really don't. They promise them, they take them and buy them clothing and show them how great it will be. They get them hooked on drugs and then this, this cycle starts and they get kind of lost in the system. And you really have to pay attention to these uh, kids, especially if they're presenting because 
again, it, it may be subtle. So here's some different tattoos of different ways they may mark them. Um, you know, you'll see inside the lip uh, a tattoo. These crowns, I've seen quite a few of these. And again, that doesn't mean they have a crown that they're being trafficked. But these are kind of some of the typical uh, signs. And these were uh, truck, truckers against trafficking who've taken some of these, uh, these photos. Or they've got property of someone on them. Barcodes are, uh, I've seen that on a couple of my patients before too. And um, anytime you've seen property of, that's concerning on a, on a patient. Um, so just pay attention to the children. Uh, you know, child abuse is everybody's business. So let's talk about documenting. When you get, when you start to document, you need to paint a picture of what you came up on. Uh, because documentation mostly happens afterwards. You're not sitting there writing while you're on scene. Uh, so, you know, really try to remember some of the big things that, that you see when you were there because it's really going to be important when you go, um, you know, especially if this child has been injured. Uh, your job is not to assume something did or didn't happen. I tell people if your pinky toe gives you a bad feeling, just report it. it it's going to be way much better way better to report than not to report and miss something on a child. Um, you know, example two, do not write bruises in different stages of healing. We cannot um, time frame, time st or stage a bruise. Um, they can't be dated. You need to document where they were, how big they were, um, the color, if there was a pattern to the bruise. Um, and please don't document no obvious trauma if you did not look. If you run a call for a child who fell and hurt their arm and you did not look at their butt or you did not look at their back or the back of their legs, do not document no obvious trauma because even though you may be going on a child who fell and hurt their arm, they may be getting the crap beat out of them at home too. You know, so just don't document something if you didn't do it. It, it's, it's a pretty big deal because when they get to the hospital, um, hopefully they're going to be looking for that also. And they're going to document that they saw a bruise or a mark, and your documentation is going to show something completely different. Um, document important information about the scene, how the patient was lying, especially if you go on a cardiac arrest. Uh, you know, were they laying face down when you got there? Did you see or smell anything? Um, you know, just kind of document the what that what the scene looked like. It's important because I, I call us a piece of the puzzle. You know, you're you're not um, the puzzle, but you're one piece of it. And with something you see, somebody else may not have seen, or they may not have realized was there, or something might have got moved um, in between you coming in and someone else coming in on the scene. Um, don't keep questioning the caregiver. If they tell you a story and, and it doesn't seem plausible, don't keep asking them because one, it may clue them in that people are suspicious um, and it may give them an opportunity to kind of work more on their story. Especially if they're like, well, I'm not really sure, but I think she could have, or I think this might've happened. Uh, just don't validate the concern or, or the mechanism that the parent told you uh, that, that they think might've happened. So this is, one of my pet peeves is reporting. Um, people, I don't think, report enough. I think there is a lot of underreporting because I don't know if people are scared to report or they don't know when to report. Um, but so what this is, what this is, is this, this, the kind of disclosures that children do. We call it um, indirect, disguised, and conditional. And this is, you know, what we call an indirect would be like, my babysitter keeps bothering me. Well, you know, what do you mean by your babysitter is bothering you? You know, sometimes Uncle James keeps me up at night. These are kind of children testing the water. Um, you know, disguise where, you know, hey, I've got a friend who, or, you know, what if I have a friend who was doing this? And, um, you know, what, what if I have a, one of my friends is being touched? What should she do about it? So, Again, these are concerning things that need to be reported. 
um, you know, conditional, I need to ask you about something, but you have to promise to keep it a secret. I never tell children, I never promise something that I can't keep. Um, what I, if a child asks you to do that, what I tell them is I can promise to keep something if I don't think it's going to hurt you. Um, I can't promise to keep a secret if I think it's going to not be safe for you because you don't want to, you don't want to take their trust away from them. That's a big thing with kids. So if you have a child that, um, if you go on a scene and they tell you something happened, please don't interrogate them about what happened. Um, you know, if they're talking to you or if they injured themselves, you can say, well, tell me how that happened. Um, you know, well, that hit me with a belt. Okay, well, thank you for telling me that. You can ask open-ended questions necessary. I don't want you to not do what you have to do to take care of a child, but you don't want to keep questioning them over and over because it's very easy to put an idea into a child's head. Because it's like if I tell you a story and then, you know, Dr. Desai tells you a story and then someone else tells you a story, um, you know, even if it's the same story, there's going to be little pieces that are different. And eventually, especially on a young child, they're, they're, gonna, they, they're going to forget some of, or may add in some of the um, events of their hearing from other people. So, you know, get your game face on. I, you know, part of, again, my job is I, the children have to tell me their history of, what, of their abuse. And don't act shocked. Don't act, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. Because that child, you may be the first person that they feel comfortable telling. And if they see you going, oh my gosh, I can't believe this just happened to this kid. You know, they may be like, I'm not telling anybody else because I'm freaked out now. Um, and try not to have them, you know, if you, especially when you go to the ER, uh, if, if you transport this child, you know, don't have them, What I need you to tell them what you told me about what happened because that kid may not want to tell anybody else. You might have been that person that they felt comfortable with and they're just not going to say anything to anybody else. Um, you know, create safety. Tell them that you, thank you for telling me what happened and, you know, be very open-ended with your, your um, again, with your questions. You know, tell them what you're going to do. Don't lie to the child. Um, I am very big on not lying to them. Um, I, I always tell them that I promise to tell them the truth. I make sure everything's on a kid-friendly level, but don't make promises that you can't keep to them. And make sure and listen to them. I, I always get on their level. I squat down and talk to them just to make sure they don't feel like there's somebody, you know, over, you know, them and that they're, uh, it's a scary person, especially if they're a little tiny kiddo. So mandated reporters, anybody in the state of Texas who is 18 or over is considered a mandated reporter. That is the law. If you are um, a professional like you are, you have a, you're considered a professional mandated reporter. Your report holds a whole lot more weight than someone who is not a professional. They're going to pounce on your report a lot faster than they're going to um, do someone else's. And, and they will get around to that, but because you're a professional and you're reporting, they're going to take your concern a little bit more seriously than they will someone else's. Um, and so I also want you to understand you cannot delegate reporting. You cannot say, I am going to tell, you know, my supervisor because I'm not sure if this needs to be reported. You, ha you have a, um, you're mandated to report a concern. You, again, you cannot delegate reporting. I can't tell my supervisor, hey, this needs to be reported. And it's fine if, you know, the hospital says, hey, we're going to report this. That's fine, but you still need to report it. Do not assume that someone else is going to report this. Again, don't assume because you know what happens when you assume. Um, so why do you need a report? So if a professional has cause to believe that a child has been or may be abused or neglected, they have to make a report no later than 48 hours after the uh, professional first suspects the child may have been abused. I, you can make reports online um, or you can call the number to make the report. If you have an immediate concern for that child, you need to make the phone call because a lot of times they're going to send um, the CPS workers out that night. They will send them to the hospital or even to the house if they consider it a priority one. And 
what that means is that child is probably going to end up in the Child Advocacy Center getting a forensic interview within 24 hours uh, if the CPS de deems it is necessary. Also, if, it, if law enforcement's been notified, please don't assume that you do not have to report to CPS. Uh, law enforcement, their job is looking at criminal acts, and of course they are concerned with the safety of the child. But CPS's job is the safety of the children. And also don't think that reporting to CPS that child's going to be taken away. That's not true. A lot of times they need basic parenting skills. They may need help with, uh, you know, gas money. They may need help with their electricity bills, uh, rent. Uh, so reporting isn't always, de it's not detrimental, always detrimental to the families. And I think a lot of times that people are afraid to report uh, because they are thinking, well, we're going to take this kid away or, or something like that. But please remember that if you have a concern, there is no reason not to report abuse um, on these children. So they're going to ask you a lot of questions when you call. It's okay to say, I don't know. I don't know probably half the questions they ask me. Um, they're, going to want, they're going to want to know the child's age, the address, uh, where it happened, if you know who all lives in the home, if there are any other siblings, uh, what the story is. And, and it's okay to tell them the patient information. The, if there is a concern for child abuse, it is not HIPAA because you're concerned for a child's safety. Uh, I can see a child without parental consent if there is a concern for child abuse. And that's, I think, Texas Family Code 32.005, I think. Um, but you do not have to, I do not have to have permission to see a child if, if I have a concern. Uh, they're going to ask you if you have any concern for gang affiliations, if there's guns in the home. Because if a CPS worker is going into that home, they need to know if there's a safety concern. Um, the number for the statewide intake, um, you can Google a Texas CPS and it will have the abuse uh, phone number for you to call. Or again, you can report on the um, internet. And it's pretty easy. They've actually made it a whole lot easier. Uh, don't, tell the C don't tell the parent that you're making a CPS report. Uh, Please don't do that. Some, I, I will tell you occasionally I've done that, but it's when the parent is already in our center. I'm seeing the child and letting them know, hey, don't freak out when CPS calls you. We have to call. You're not in trouble. Nothing's going to happen to you. But if you're concerned that this child is being abused, do not let that parent know that you're calling them. They do not want them to know this. Uh, and so just be prepared to answer a lot of questions. And again, it's fine to not know the answers. So um, when so CPS, what they do is they uh, determine if there's substantial risk of harm. Um, you know, location of the injuries, the child's age, uh, previous history of abuse and neglect, um, how the injury was inflicted. And it's okay for you to say, you know, I have a concern because, or, you know, I'm not really sure if this happened, but when I came on scene, I walked in this house, and this child was, you know, parents said X, but it's not matching up. And I, I really have a concern that this child was injured, you know, some other way. If you run on a wreck and there, there is a, a drunk parent with a child in the car, even though law enforcement's going to be on scene, please make a report to CPS. I, again, if you go to a house and there's someone passed out, if they're intoxicated, or, you know, even if, you know, a concern may be a parent whose seizures aren't controlled and they're not taking their medication and they have a child at home, that, that's a concern, especially if it's a, a young child. Uh, so it's sometimes things you wouldn't think about, but if, if you have a concern, a child is in a situation that puts them in harm's way, then you need to report. You're not ever going to be uh, get, you're never going to get in trouble for reporting. Um, you could potentially save a life for reporting, but a child could potentially lose their life for not reporting. Um, again, these are just the, um, the reports. Um, we've already talked about that. So Rubith Renteria, she is the uh, Director of Community Education at the Child Advocacy Center here in Smith County. She is always available to answer any questions or to uh, help you guys if there's a question about um, uh, reporting. 
Um, I'm also on our child fatality review team here in Smith County. We review every child death that occurs within the county, and she's the director of that, um, that team. And then there's my information, and that's my cell phone number. I am always happy to answer any questions anytime. I, I truly don't mind. Um, now, if you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, I will probably have to sneak out of my bedroom and call you back, but I answer my phone 24 hours a day. Um, but I, I would prefer you to call me if you have a question or concern um, and it, than to not call me and, and maybe your question wasn't answered. So I think that's it. If Is there anything else that I need to... I appreciate you guys listening to me mumble and, and I hope that that was helpful. Um, again, it was kind of boring, but you know, it's one of those boring necessities. <laughs> all right. I don't think it was boring at all. I think it was uh, very educational and I think very useful for those of us that are on the front lines. Um, well, thank you for coming. Sure. We very much appreciate you having. It's a very important topic that all of our crews and anybody that works in frontline medicine needs to know about because, um, you know, this is, this is kind of like a STEMI. You're better over calling than under calling it. Okay, because this is this is someone's uh, it's a precious little life, and you certainly don't want uh, this to continue if there's any hint of concern there. Um, again, we thank you, Megan, uh, for for being with us today and giving us this talk. For those of you that participated, uh, please email the education clinical department to get uh, credit for the live CE. Um, and until next time, uh, you guys take care. Thank you. <laughs>